<laughs> yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, spatial variability work that I've been doing over the last couple seasons here. Um, so yeah, so I'll just go over my goals, the, a little bit of background, then my methods and results, and try to talk about the implications a little bit. Um, this, this video. So this is a video that I fed a bunch of you guys to see. Um, from down at Wolf Creek um, a number of years ago. But this is really why, I mean, this just it throws me away every time I see this video. If we have our five tracks on the slope, here's the sixth guy, and then we have the seventh guy come down, and bam, it takes out the whole slope. And that slope, I mean, it's just, it's such, I mean, it's a big uniform meadow, and it's just wild to me that it's seven people go down, and then that uh, or that seventh guy hit that spot and it just what's different is it the initiation's different or is there is he hitting that spot that uh, it's more likely to propagate so my like my biggest question is figuring out how variable fracture propagation is and then uh, from that is there something else that we could look at before we get to a slope and figure out you know weak layer type or hazard level or the variability in snow depth, the slab hardness, like before we even get to a slope, if we know those things, can that give us a proxy for um, how variable the propagation is going to be? And then uh, when you're on a slope, figuring out where you want to do your tests of, is it in the thickest part of the slope is propagating, thinner parts, um, is it the slab, um, total snow depth? And so, you know, I know there's a, been a lot of research on spatial variability over the years. And I definitely talk to people. People sometimes are like fed up, or like, why are you bothered to do this? But there still hasn't been that very much work done on the variability of propagation. So uh, the initial um, uh, people initially were saying, you know, shear quality um, seems to be less variable, and that's indicating that maybe propagation will also be less variable. Um, so I wanted to see if that was really true. Um, you know, there's been uh, Ron and Carl, and then uh, Gordy and Carl have done, there were uh, eight different slopes where they did, you know, between 12 and 35 ECTs. And the initial ones from Ron and Carl, they were seeing uh, pretty uniform propagation or actually a slab change that they could tell, and like the top half propagated and the bottom half didn't. Then um, when Gordy and Carl went out, there were some days when they got like eight uh, ECTs to propagate and eight not, and sort of randomly on the slope. And so I wanted to see if really what was uh, more usual, and uh, then if there was an effect. Uh, they also talked about, you know, they did some work in New Zealand, some work here, and the New Zealand work was seeming more uniform. And was that because of the snow climate or the weak layer type? Um, so there's also then. Um, been some studies looking at uh, the effectiveness of the ECT and how well um, the false stable and false unstable and what those rates are. And so we saw a contingency table earlier that Bruce was showing, but basically it's, um, so if the slope is actually stable, you want your test result to tell you it's stable. If the slope is actually unstable, you want to get an unstable test result. And these false stables and false unstables are uh, what we're concerned with. And from some early work of um, Carl and Ron and then uh, Winkler, uh, you know, for false stable rates, they're getting somewhere between 1% and 6%, um, uh, 1%, 6%, maybe 20%, and then uh, somewhere under 20% um, for false unstables. And these were uh, seeming to be better than uh, some other stability tests that we've been using. But I wanted to see, um, so I'm also just interested to see uh, how my results line up with that, um, with how effective the ECT is. And so slope oak selection, um, I went out and basically, as Carl was talking, it was like going out and picking the most boring uniform slope I could find and trying to get the stratigraphy exactly the same, the snow depth exactly the same, um, slope angle aspect, all that stuff wind sheltered and then just big enough so I had enough room to do these tests. But because of that, um, that's definitely, I wasn't going up in starting zones and doing my ECTs. So that's just something to think of, of you know, maybe uh, a reason why my results might be different or just not as applicable to um, 
other slopes. So I do 28 ECTs on a slope, and I just use the loading increments of a stuff block to try and minimize the difference of tapping um, from my doing 28 ECTs on a slope over the day. Um, so this is just uh, up by Fairy Lake, and that's those stars are where all my, East, or that's, I don't have a fish at my lens, but that's uh, sort of looking at how a slope would look, where all the stars are ECTs um, as you go out. So uh, as I go through here, um, my red dots are going to be ECTPs, uh, blue dots ECTNs, and then the green are the Xs. Um, it was a 30 by 30 meter grid. Um, I had 15 field days with 23 um, grids of ECTs, so it's something in the order of 650 ECTs for this data set. So this is the first way I uh, looked at this. This is basically just a histogram of all of my results. So on this bottom here is, you can see over on the left-hand side, 0% propagation. So that's when I did a whole slope and none of my uh, ECTs propagated. And so about 40% of the time uh, of my slopes, that's what I was getting. Then on the other side, you know, when pretty much everything propagates, that's pretty clearly an unstable test result. And, you know, what's bothering me is all these, all these grids that I have that are in the middle. So these days when 50% of my uh, ECT is propagated and 50% didn't. And so the question is like, why is that? And is there something else of, is the snow depth more variable? Is something else going on here? Um, and I mean, if you go out on the slope, how are you going to know whether you're um, happening to hit a place where it's propagating or not? And is that false stable or false unstable? And with my data, I was on these slopes that, I mean, they weren't steep enough to slide in the first place. So I can't, um, it's, I can't give you a fault. Like this, is, this slope here, 50% propagated, 50% didn't. But I don't know if it had been steeper and somebody had thrown an explosive on it, if it would have slid or not. There's just no way to tell from my data set. So what I actually did because of that is I um, set it up. Again, this is the same data, but uh, percent agreement, which essentially is just 100% over here means that all the tests were the same. So they all propagated or they all didn't propagate. And then over here is 50% propagated, 50% didn't propagate. And what you can see here is that, so that 90% line, um, you know, about half of the grids I did, you had more than 10% of the tests were different than the uh, slope as a whole. So if you, more than 10% of, if, if yeah, you had less than 90% um, agreement. And that's saying that on those days, your false stable rate was go going out. That's a greater than 10%. I mean, here it's, I'm having a 50% false stable rate. And so, went, did a bunch of data analysis, and this whole bunch of things I looked at that I wasn't finding any correlation with. So first thing I looked at is I wanted to see if uh, the, the variability in snow depth across my slope, if that was correlating with the variability, if it was just, you know, slopes that were more hummocky or had got some wind effect, um, and wasn't to find a correlation there, or the slab thickness, weak layer thickness, snow depth, or the variability in any of those. And I also broke those down by weak layer types thinking that you know, maybe a uh, uh, depth or layer is going to be more affected by the snow depth than a surface or layer that's only getting affected by the snow on top of it. Um, so then what I did find, the first uh, result that I got that was like, oh, wow, this is, I'm seeing something here, is I took the just forecasted um, hazard level for the type of slope I was on um, from the Avalanche Center. and then on the, this axis here, plotted the percent of my ECTs that propagated. So you could see that when the forecasters were calling for low danger, I was never getting more than, whatever, less than 10% of my pits to propagate. And when they were calling for considerable, I was always up above that 80%. But unfortunately, it's the moderate hazard days that are hardest. Um, just because, you know, on a low day, you can, there's going to be other signs telling you that it's pretty low, and on a considerable day, you know, you might see in natural activity, might be getting one thing. But this moderate day is also when I was seeing the biggest range variability, and also just these, I mean, this is telling me there's a lot of false stables on those days, too. 
Um, so another way I broke this down, um, as you can see, the orange is my cons uh, considerable days, moderate are the yellow, and green are the low days. And you can see, again, that it's just the days when the uh, danger rating was forecasted higher, you're tending to have more propagation, and those moderate days sort of span a bigger uh, gap than either of uh, the considerably low. Um, so basically, the take-home message is that, so these results are in line with the previous spatial work of, you know, there's a big range of variability. There's some days when you're going to get totally uniform results, and there's some days when you're going to get really variable results. Um, and I'm also, I'm seeing significant variability at both ends of the spectrum, so it's not just, um, you know, false, uh, like a false stable when you have 27 propagate and one doesn't. I'm also seeing the days when 27 don't propagate and one does. So seeing false stables and uh, false unstables. And you know, as far as I could tell, my, uh, it's not a wind effect. It's not something going on with the variability in the stratigraphy. There's something else going on that I wasn't able to capture, that I wasn't able to see. Um, and it's most variable with moderate hazard, which is a tough take home message because that's when you want these stability tests to work the most for you. Um, but just some other thoughts are, so why are some slopes showing so much variability and what could we do to look at that? Um, I, something I wanna do is look at the just snow structure variability. It would be really sweet to take like a snow micro pan or something out and get a hardness profile at all of my pits. And may, you know, maybe it's minute hardness changes or small scale snow depth, like weak layer changes that I wasn't able to see. And then maybe if I was able to get a bigger sample size, I'd be able to see differences of, you know, maybe there's something going on uh, if I was only looking at surface or if I was only looking at depth or, um, but with the size data set I had, I just, I mean, I was still getting too much scatter. Um, and then the other question is, you know, am I just seeing these, uh, very, like these high levels of variability because I'm picking these weird little meadows that nobody wants to ski? But there's also <laughs> some of my uh, slopes through. I mean, there's one slope where I, I was, like, the slope I used, I mean, it's a slope that when I go out with Doug and Carl and Mark, uh, or Doug and, yeah, um, Eric and Mark, we, uh, we'd, like, we'd go dig, dig pits there. So, I mean, it is, these are slopes also that, forecasters are using. So I think that there is some of these slopes that are uh, representative of terrain that people actually get into do have this high level of variability on some days. So there's something real going on here. Um, another thing I want to look at is just see um, how well the ECT is working. We have a number of different ways of data sets. So we have data from Snowpilot that some of that um, effectiveness was coming at, and then data from just one observer or Ron. I, uh, and he said, seen the test working really well, but I'm uh, going to get some Snowpilot data of just looking at the Gallatin um, Forecast Center and when they do two tests, how likely are they to agree with one another? And so I should have that by ICW in the fall. And um, just to see like, if you're doing one test in a forecasting setting, how likely are you to, if you do another test nearby, are they going to line up? Are they going to be way different? Um, I also looked at uh, trying to get spatial patterns of, you know, are we, do we have clusters? Do we have just random spread when they're variable? But really it was, um, there was too much variability in my data. Uh, it was just some slopes. There was like a line down the middle and you could see the one half propagated, one half didn't. But then the frustrating ones were the ones where it was just like buckshot and it was nothing, it was totally scattered. Um, and so then there was some talk also, um, Carl's talking about you know, modifying the ECT, I was doing the standard just one meter ECT. Would it be different if we were doing um, two meter ECTs using longer ECTs? Um, and I'm not sure that's going to solve. It seems like it would increase the false, um, uh, false unstables or false stables and not do anything for the false um, stables. And so, so we're, we're having uh, problems at both ends of the spectrum. So I'm not sure that a two meter column is going to solve anything. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, I just want to thank the people who gave me money and 
um, big guy in the club for giving me access to do some tests, and then my committee members and the forecasters for helping me out. So, uh, questions? Yeah. Just, just to comment that the gray area variability stuff that's in that test is, is important, I think, to a lot of us who are sitting in the hot seat where we're, we potentially have a inbound avalanche or a, a guy that has a, an avalanche where he uh, thought it was elsewise and, and is then uh, in a legal situation being sued for not getting it right. Uh, then somebody goes up and does one of these tests in the crown after the fact that says, see, this works. And to be able to call on a paper like yours to say, well, we could have been wrong with that also is, a, is an important part of it. Yeah. Uh, supporting our, uh, <laughs> our problem when someone saying, well, your explosive test is a wrong test, you should have been doing this. Uh, so yep. just, just, you might end up on the witness stand. <laughs> <laughs>